Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast Extra, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. The Tough Girl Podcast is sponsorship and ad-free, and that's thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons. Find out more about supporting your favorite podcast and becoming a patron. Please check out Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast. All patrons will get their name on a dedicated patrons page on the Tough Girl website. All female patrons, $5 and above, are invited to join the closed Facebook group, the Tough Girl Tribe. Today, I'm delighted we're going to be catching up with Joe Bradshaw. We're going to be talking about dealing with grief, climbing Denali, and we're also going to be getting a Seven Summits update. Please note, during this episode, we do talk about grief and mental health, so please ensure that you are in a good place before you listen to this episode. Oh, Tribe, I am so excited that we are catching up with Joe Bradshaw. Hi, Joe. Hello, how are you? Oh, I am fantastic. I was just about, Good. We were just about to I was just about to start nattering with Joe because I haven't spoken to her for so long and I thought, no, we need to get this recorded on the podcast. So I was just looking back to when we first spoke to you. So we initially first spoke on February the 1st in 2016, where you shared more about your early early years and then you were going to go and climb Everest that year, but you dealt with the earthquake. And then we caught up again in September 15th of 2016 after you summited Mount Everest. And I think mm. this is the weird part because how is it almost the end of 2019 and I haven't spoken oh, I to know. you for like three <laughs> years? Because yeah. I feel it's so weird. I feel so connected to you, especially through social media and, and knowing what's been going on over the past couple of, of years. It's um, it's very strange. But anyway, um, going off on a tangent, Joe, amazing to have you back on Tough Girl Extra. I'd love for you, for people who maybe haven't heard the first couple of episodes, would you just like to introduce yourself and tell everybody a little bit more about who you are and what your background is? So I am... Um... Now an expedition leader, outdoor instructor, and I do some public speaking too. But I am a former no-saying, height-hating, comfort-loving sofa surfer who had a very normal existence, um, had an office job, and wasn't really very happy doing that. And it um, it was a friend who sort of kicked my backside into going to do something. So after a very crazy parachute jump which I will never ever do I never say never but I'll never do that again I then signed up to do a bike ride in Peru for charity and that is what what really sort of started the ball rolling but very slowly it was a very very gentle roll to begin with because I never thought I would ever be doing what I'm doing now sort of uh, 14 years ago when it all started so yeah it's been I've moved up the adventure ladder or sort of along the adventure journey very organically so I never thought I never had in my head oh I want to go and climb Everest or I want to lead 34 expeditions on Kilimanjaro which I've just done or or any of that stuff it was very much step by step never thinking that I was capable of doing the next step and it was the champions in my life so Caroline to begin with who sort of kicked my butt (laughs) doing the bike ride and various people after that who've got me where I am today and a lot of grit and determination and failure and success and all of those things that are involved in in uh sort of getting on with life really Oh, absolutely fantastic. And, and you know, as, as I mentioned, we, we've talked to Jo um, about her early years and her transition into the adventure space and overcoming this fear of heights. So I will put all the links to the previous episodes that we've spoken about. But Jo, I'd love to go back to after summiting Everest. So you've summited Everest, absolutely incredible. That was, we spoke again in September 2016. What was the end of 2016 like? Were there adventure blues? Was it, did you, have you come to terms with the fact that you climbed the highest mountain in the no. whole world? <laughs> <laughs> it's still nuts because I, I got back from Everest and two days later I was unblocking my kitchen sink, you know, and it, it's life totally goes back to normal and you live this amazing uh this almost double life on expeditions where you're living in a bubble and all this incredible stuff is happening actually on on something like Everest a lot of not much happening happens and then you get you know you go and climb and then you do a lot of sitting around and acclimatizing and 
waiting for the weather to become good. So it's a very sort of hurry up and wait type um, life I lead. And then you come back home and life is normal. And I've got two dogs, which my mum has. And, you know, so I look after it. Well, they're with me when, when I'm not away. So it's all very life is normal. And I got back from Everest and I think I actually then spent 10 days asleep. So I was so tired because the expedition come down is immense. And it for anybody who has spent a long time working towards achieving something, whether it's a project or an expedition or whatever, and, and you've probably found this as well, is that there is there's always going to be expedition blues, but it's because it meant so much to you and you've you're left with this void and you need to fill it with something. And I usually fill it with another expedition. So I'm quite lucky. But um yeah, so I, I I went straight back to work and as my sort of role is I do a lot of Duke of Edinburgh expedition training and assessment. And so that's filled up my summer and I was out doing other expeditions overseas and I was really fortunate for Everest one, the earthquake one and Everest two to, to a sponsor found me actually. And I could never have done it without this individual. He wanted nothing from it but other than me to promote and raise funds for children's mental health charity place to be. And so I did all of that and I was really proud of it and raised lots of money. And then I went and had a meeting with him in, was it November, 2016, thinking it would be a sort of well done. Thanks very much. You know, carry on with your life type thing. And, and he said, what would you do next? And I'd, I'd been asked, that you always get asked that as soon as you finish something or even before you've done it people go so what's next and I I reeled off all this stuff that I'd quite like to achieve but time and money you know time you can make money is in my job is is not not very free-flowing so uh so I I, you know I said I'll I'll do these at some point and sort of make them happen and and he said well send me a proposal and we'll look at forwarding on the your journey in one of these aspects as well as continuing to promote place to be which was fantastic you know I never you never get I never thought I'd get the opportunity to climb Everest once let alone attempt it twice and then to move on so we came up with a plan for me to to attempt to complete the seven summits so I'd already done four three of them through work so I'd done Kilimanjaro, Aconcagua and Elbrus through work Everest then came and the natural progression after that was to finish them off. So Denali in Alaska, um, Carson's Pyramid in Indonesia and then Mount Vincent. So that was that was sort of set in stone and I um, went and climbed. I make it sound so easy. I just popped <laughs> off to Alaska in June 2017 and spent three weeks trying to climb Denali and, and reached the summit. Amazingly, the weather had been so bad. And we were really lucky. We had the most of all of the days of the 18-day expedition. It's quite a short expedition. Our summit day was absolutely perfect. I don't think I've ever had a more perfect summit day. It was freezing cold, but there wasn't much wind. There weren't many people around, and we had the summit to ourselves. And I was stood on top of Denali, and I went, this is so much better than Everest. And everyone was like, seriously? I was like, you have no idea. It was just the most incredible expedition. So I got back from that and that was number five and that was fantastic. And this was nearly two and a half years ago now. And my sponsor said, right, off to Carstens, go and get it sorted. And unfortunately, my father became ill when I was sorting out the expedition. So I had to cancel that. And subsequently, he passed away at the end of 2017 and I was then in this sort of horror void vortex whatever you want to call it of grief which I was just trying to get through day to day and I was trying to get cast and sorted as well as you know everything else in life and um, unfortunately my sponsor then had to pull out so I just parked everything in 2018 and of the seven summits wise and I had to concentrate on work to pay my mortgage and and just my mental health because it was taking quite a bit of a of a knock um so yeah 
2018 came and went. And at the beginning of this year, my mum and I went on a cruise up and down the coast of Norway on a Hurti Gruten boat. It was absolutely fantastic. I'm not a cruise person and neither is my mum, but we thought, right, we'll give it a go. We want to see the Northern Lights, something that dad would have loved to have done, but would have got very frustrated about because he was a sort of doer. You know, he would have been in the engine room. and He would have been <laughs> up on the bridge and everything and you're not allowed to do that. And I was, um, I did a couple of talks on the ship and I thought, well, if this isn't a good way of sort of, you know, moving forward with my seven summits thing. And it was this year is the 25th anniversary of place to be. And I'm like, right, now's the time. Now is I've got to get my mojo back and, and get on with it. So I've sort of spent the last two years really trying to put a team together for Carstens and it's been really hard and find the right provider and it was all set to go and then we were supposed to go on the 29th of September last month and on the 28th of September, it's 24 hours before we went, it was cancelled. <laughs> and I was sat in my spare room just finishing packing and I saw this picture up on Instagram saying Carsten's closed so I got in touch with my agent and he confirmed it saying there's too much unrest out in West Papua and it, and the police aren't issuing permits for Carsten's and they're actually closing the country to to tourists and foreigners until the troubles and the civil unrest um, eases off and all gets better so I was so close <laughs> to doing number six uh, and then number seven would be Vincent at the end of this year. Um, but now Vincent is number six and that's all cool. So that's, I leave on the 14th of December and it's amazing. And I really hope that the unrest in Chile, which is going on now, calms down so we can, because we had to fly into Chile, go down to Punta Arenas. Um, and that's where you get the big cargo plane, the Russian cargo plane onto Antarctica. So fingers crossed it will go to plan <laughs> Abs- no. absolutely i mean yeah. lots lots going on there I, yeah. yeah obviously you know so sorry to hear about your dad that's just mm. oh devastating <laughs> yeah yeah no it's it's i mean he was he was pretty old and he had he had collected four different types of cancers and in in a very short space of time and he was an absolute lover of life and he would have lived forever you know some people are are just like right I'm done now but he right to the end he was like I just want to go on he had so much to do and so much he wanted to do and he was very much a say yes now and work it out later and I was not so much like that in my early life I was quite I think more of a timid child and I've really taken on that that fervor and vigor for life in the last probably 10 or 12 years and sp- and particularly since the earthquake in Nepal in 2015 where we truly thought we were going to lose our lives and you just realize that this isn't and this is very cliche but it's not rehearsal and it's not you know we don't there's no plan b and there's no second chance um so much um and I think when you when I had that, oh my gosh, I'm going to, this is, this is how I'm going to die. I'm like, no, I'm not done yet either. I have got so much more living to do and it's making the most of, of that time. And he would have, you know, he was very much of that mindset. So whenever I'm sort of having a bit of a difficult time or, you know, a bit worried about stuff and I've, I've had to fundraise, I'm now fundraising for the expedition costs as well as for the charity and I find it very difficult asking people for money for my expedition, but without that support for Vincent, because Carsten's I've, I've saved and paid for myself, I wouldn't be doing it and I wouldn't be promoting the charity and trying to get more money for them. And he would just go, just keep going. Don't give up. You've got this girl, you know, all of those sort of positive things. And it's like, what would dad say? And he's just like, get on with it. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
but Bless him. I know yeah. I know he'd be so proud of you for yeah. for for what you're doing, what you're achieving. Mm. Um, it is incredible, and especially you know raising money for charity. That's phenomenal. Mm. I have to say, I do like I'd, I'd love I love the idea of your sponsor. I'm like I need I need a sponsor. Like a, oh just, god, yeah, just... I and it was unreal because I wasn't when I signed up to. When I decided to climb Everest, um, so we, I made the decision in 2014 and I had 12 months to raise the, the funds. And I was, you know, I was going to, I don't know how, even how I was going to do it because it's a lot of money. It's a ridiculous amount of money. I, I mean, it's not the 80,000 pounds some people think it is. It's, you know, but it's still, it's a huge amount of money, especially when as an outdoor instructor, I don't earn much. And and that's totally my choice. And I could go and get a job in the city again, like I used to and all of this and earn lots of money, but I don't want to live that life anymore. You know, I don't want to live it again. So, and this opportunity came to me and other people get sponsored. And I was thinking, wow, this is, you know, things like this don't happen to people like me, but actually people like me are all over the place and it does happen. And without this individual there's no way I would have I probably would have got to Everest the first time but there's absolutely no way I would have been able to go back after the earthquake because I couldn't I couldn't pay for it again and insurance doesn't cover it all and you know it's it was a huge commitment and on the first expedition as well in 2015 I wanted to make the expedition more about sort of helping other people to achieve their dreams rather than just what it was about for me. So I put together a team of six Duke of Edinburgh gold students and my sponsor um, sponsored half of their costs and they raised their other, the other half of their costs plus some money for place to be. And we took them up to Everest base camp and they climbed a mountain next door, 6,000 are called it Lobuchet. Lobuchet East. And, uh, and he he said, sure, I'll, I'll, you know, I want to sort of give back as well. I mean, he's already giving back massively, but it was, it was much more than just about what I was about. And unfortunately, they'd already gone home by the time the earthquake happened, thank God. Um, but to get that one opportunity was amazing. And I thought as, you know, I climbed with a friend of mine, Rolf, and we thought when we got back to get base camp, well, that's it. I'm not going to get this opportunity again. Um, and then fortunately I found my mobile phone <laughs> in all the crazy, ridiculous, I mean, base camp was just a disaster zone and I was digging for my kit and found my mobile phone and it worked and that's how the conversation started again. And it's those little, it's all about sliding doors. It's those little nuggets of hope that you just hang on to. And when you think all is lost, then something, something you know, does come your way, but, and that's what I'm feeling at the moment, you know, trying to now that I don't have that support anymore and thinking, I don't want to give up on this. I've already told people I'm going to climb the seven summits. Um, you know, I want to complete it. I've said, I'll do it. I want to continue raising money for the charity because I really believe in what they do. And I want to put the support and the awareness as well. The awareness is really important. And I could have, you know, when he pulled out, I could have gone, yeah, no, that's it. I'll just crack on with sort of work and doing other other expeditions. But I'm like, no, I've made this commitment and I don't want to go back on it. So I will find a way. And that's really hard when I'm now quite a lot in debt. <laughs> I'm just thinking, oh, but I can't, you know, it's my choice to do this. Um, it's totally my choice to do this. So. I am continuing to raise the money for the charity and for the expedition and it will, it will happen one way or another. It'll work. It will. It absolutely. Yeah, it will. It will. So, yeah. I'd love to talk more about Denali as well. Mm. So Denali yeah. over in Alaska. And yeah. I'd love to talk about in terms of your, your approach to it, because Oh, after you, you know, you, your life is going on expeditions, you've climbed Kilimanjaro 34 times, you've been to, you know, Everest Base Camp numerous times, you know, Everest once and been there twice. And, um, you know, you do travel the world and do expeditions. Does your mind mindset change when you're preparing for more of like a solo expedition? Or, or are you, I don't want to use the word more 
blasé, but is it now so in your comfort zone that actually it's not, it doesn't really change you? You don't really do either extra training yeah. or extra preparation. How, how does that work? Yeah, so Denali is is a mountain I've wanted to climb for probably 10 years. And I first read about it in Mark Beaumont's book. He cycled, he, the man who cycled the Americas. So he started up in North America in Alaska and he climbed Denali and he wrote in his book so eloquently about the mountain and how beautiful it was and what a tough expedition it was, but it was, you know, doable. And I read that in, I think, gosh, 2010 or something when I was on, on one of my very early Kilimanjaro's and I've had this vision in my head ever since of I'd really love to do it, but I'm not capable. It's not for people like me. I'm just this kind of middle-aged female who's just go, you know, goes and does stuff. And I think it was like I was saying earlier, all of my climbs have happened because I wanted to do that climb never to get myself onto the next thing. So I never, when I, climb my first 6,000 meter peak in 2011 for my, it was kind of my 40th treat for myself. My uncle, bless him, there's a lot of death in this, isn't it? My uncle had <laughs> passed away. <laughs> it's not happens. Uh, my uncle had passed away the year before and left me a bit of money. And that really enabled me to, it was another one of those sliding door things. It enabled me to go and start off doing bigger expeditions. And I climbed Mirror Peak in Nepal in, uh, end of April I think it was 2011 never expecting then to go and do something else I thought that would be it you know and then the next thing came along and I took that opportunity having always saying no to everything and then eventually saying yes I was quite hard work at the time I think so when I got to Denali and I got the opportunity to do it I actually couldn't quite believe it I was yes straight away it was like it was it was an absolute no-brainer and I worked my backside off for it um oh my backside grew actually quite a lot because of the training so I knew that we were pulling sleds or pulling polks I knew that we'd be carrying 20 kilos I knew that it was unsupported so there was there's you your team of fellow climbers and your guides and we all work as a team I knew we'd be putting up our own tents it's not like in Nepal or in other on Kilimanjaro where the Porters or the Sherpas do all of that for you on most expeditions, not all, because on Manaslu we're doing all of that ourselves, another 8,000. So it was very much um, you, your team, working with the mountain, not against it, because the weather is, weather with anything, isn't it, is pretty much the, the yay or nay of whether you go or not. So I I got a tire from a friend, so a big 23 kilo tire called Dave. <laughs> Dave the tire from David and Goliath. Um, named my tire because I knew I had to make friends with this thing. And um, a, a lovely company um, run by a, some former clients, now friends of mine, uh, made a cover for him so that you know he looked really smart and people could see what I was doing. And I started dragging Dave around the new forest. I'd take him when I was doing DV. So I'd be up and down hills in Wales, um, all over the place and, uh, and increasing my, the weight in my backpack, you know, as we go along. So by the last month I was dragging the same, if not more and carrying than I would be on Denali because I wanted to get there and I didn't want to be not the weakest member of the team, but the one that people are going, Oh, you know, she's not going to be able to do this. I wanted to be on top form and I absolutely was. I found it was hard. Of course it was hard. Um, the conditions out there are pretty harsh. The first few days you travel at night and sleep during the day. And even at night it's, it, we went in June, so it's 24 hour daylight. It just becomes a, a less harsh light, more pinky bluey light. It's really beautiful with the sort of midnight sun and then during the day it's either baking hot when the sun comes out and the clouds aren't around or it's freezing cold when the clouds come over so you're zipping up your tent you're unzipping your tent you're opening your sleep <laughs> you're trying to get some sleep you're baking you're not for you know you're freezing it's so the first few days were definitely tough and I think when you're getting into any expedition and sort of getting into the groove and 
getting to know your teammates and the guides. And even though I'm a guide in sort of leader in my day to day life, I was very much there as a, you know, they're in charge, they know what they're doing, but they totally understood that this was my world as well. And I was sharing with an amazing lady who's now a very good friend called Linda, who's a GB Ironman triathlete. So there was these two British, or she's North, uh, Northern Irish, she's these two British UK females who are sort of pretty kick-ass and pretty, <laughs> pretty full on. And we were just, you know, part of the team. We had a, another seven or eight guys and three guides. So there was, there was 11 of us in total, 12 of us in total. So yeah, it was good. It was good. But what I find is when I'm guiding clients and I'm not feeling great for whatever reason, I, I can channel my concentration onto them. So you forget how you're feeling and you just get on with things. But when on, you know, my personal expeditions, I don't have that channel. That's, I find it harder because you then absorbed into your own little world of pain. And that happened on Everest a few times. And I found it really hard to to get over that. And I've sort of worked out coping mechanisms for different scenarios. So you learn a little bit more about yourself on every single expedition. And you're always expanding your normal and, you know, setting new benchmarks. No more earthquakes, hopefully. I don't want that as a benchmark <laughs> anymore. But, you know, Denali was definitely, I think I lo- what I loved about it the most is because of it was unsupported, we did everything. And we battled the weather and we had to sometimes hunker down in camp when it was too bad. And then we, you know, made a break for it when it was good. And we really earned that expedition. And I absolutely loved it. And then we had a 24 hour walk out. So when you're coming out, you, you're you picking up um, all of the kit that you've left along the way down. So your polks are getting heavier and heavier on the way down. The, the polks slide past you on the downhill. We'd been going for 24 hours when we finally got back up to the airstrip on the glacier. We were all absolutely done in and the snow was thigh deep and it was just like, oh, give us a break. But when you finish, no, that's it. It's done. You know, no more pain. It's done. Fantastic. And it was just, it was awesome. Yeah, it was just fantastic. You mentioned about using different coping mechanisms for different to, for different situations. I'd love for you to share some of those practical pieces of um, yeah. you know, those practical pieces of advice. Yeah, sure. So I I the main the main ones I use um, are uh, so when I'm maybe going out for a tough day or I'm going for summit and. I used this on Kilimanjaro uh, last week, actually. I stood up there and it must have sounded really arrogant, but fortunately my group didn't take it that way. And I said, when we go for summit on Kili, I, in my head, we're just going for another walk. It's just another day on the hill. And I used that when I was leaving the South Coal on Everest. And I we left the South Coal on Everest at 8.30 at night. And in my head, I was like, it's just another day on the hill. I'm just going up to camp. I'm just... It's the next step that counts. That's it. So I make things much smaller because otherwise you can have this overwhelming. And I see it in clients on expeditions all the time when you've worked so hard for the summit day. And for me, it's about the journey and all sorts of things can happen in between. And if you make it this massive thing and this big summit day, it sometimes gets too much and people get frightened by it. And in my head, if it's just another walk, we're just going for another walk. We're just putting one foot in front of the other. Then it, it it calms the nerves and it makes it a much more manageable part of 12 hours out of the whole of your life or what have you, whatever it is. So that's very much something, you know, if I'm going for a long tire drag, you know, if I've set up a, a hard training day and I'm going for a tire drag that's going to be five or six hours, I'm like, this is five or six hours out of the whole of my life. You know, it's minuscule compared. It may feel quite big that that time, but it's minuscule compared to the grand scheme of things. And it's getting me to a place that I want to, to be. So that's fitter and stronger and more mentally prepared. 
And the other the other things that I use as well are positive poly and negative Nelly. And I think I spoke about them in the last in the the last um, podcast I did with you. So I have these characters that sit on my shoulder. So on my left shoulder is negative Nelly, and on my right shoulder is positive poly. And they really came to the fore for me when I was at Camp Two on Everest in 2016, and I'd been having a really tough time mentally with a couple of climbers who uh, were particularly unpleasant and were playing a bit of a psychological game and I didn't want to be part of it. I just wanted to walk off. And I was sat in my tent and negative Nelly was like, you're, you're not capable of this. This is crazy. You don't deserve to be here. They're right. You know, you're, you're weak and all of this sort of stuff. And, and I know Anna enough uses the soldiers of self doubt and the cheerleaders. And this is my version of this. And I sort of came up with it in my head, you know, years ago and, and it's really helped me. And then positive Polly has, has sort of chipped in going you are capable you can do this you've done the training you've earned your right to be here so, you know forget about them it's like being at school and when your bullies at school bully you it's because they're insecurities and and everything it's not about you it's about their problems so forget their problems and just get on and climb and that's what I did you know I was so close to walking off in uh, camp two in 2016 and and then I thought well for what you know I'm not proving anything to anybody and I know I'm capable of doing it so very much on expeditions I had a a a bit of a tough day on Denali when I was carrying extra load um, because we needed to carry as a group we needed to carry the loads and there was a load waiting to go in someone's pack and and I said yeah no I'll take it I'm fine and you know I'm sure I'm fit and strong enough and I picked it up and put it in my backpack and thought, oh, this is a bit heavy. And it smells a little bit of poo as well. And we'd been using these canisters to poop in. And then you take the plastic bags out and you bury them. And then you pick them up on the way back down and take them out. So everything, it's a very clean mountain. Everything's taken out. So I thought, well, maybe it's just sort of residual smell. <laughs> anyway, we were going up this monster hill on Denali. And I was at the back. I was at the back of my rope coat. I can do this. And then Nelly was like, no, you can't. This is too much. You're not capable. And all this stuff was going on in my head. Anyway, one of my, the guy in front of me, Dan, amazing chap, he said, oh, well, let's share. Let me take it for a bit. And he picked it out of my pack and put it in his. And 10 minutes later, he's like, no, I'm not doing this. And I'd have been carrying it for three hours. Anyway, they, and the guide said, well, let's, let's split out the contents we thought it was fuel and a few other bits and it ended up being the bag of poop <laughs> I'm really carrying this bag of shit uphill so the moral of that story is if it smells like poop it usually is anyway we buried it left it picked it up on the way back down gave the guide who'd given to me a lot of stick but it proved to me that if something doesn't feel right then it usually isn't so follow your instincts there's there's loads of stuff like that you know that I I can use and then the third one that I really use as well is um when I was climbing Manaslu in 2013 and then I was thinking about Everest um I read Rebecca Stevens book who's the first British lady to climb Everest and then complete the seven summits and in that book she she says uh, talking about ladders and how you get across the crevasses. And she says, your eyes are like a camera lens and you focus on what's important. And you can either focus on the big, scary hole and the 300 meter drop to oblivion, or you can focus on the rungs of the ladder, which are keeping you safe and the rope that you're attached to. So if you do fall, you're not going to go far. Um, and the, the other end and all the things that are going to get you to your goal. So that's a, that's, kind of little my little trio of of support that I use in my head and I use them a lot when I'm guiding and teaching and instructing and all sorts so a bit of a long answer but there you go (laughs) but I find they help they help you know and and people do use them they sort of take them on and use them as well so that's really cool no absolutely and then you talked about I mean sort of going through almost like the, the three years 2017 was Denali 2018 you said that was for you to really focus on your yeah. on work and, and mental health 
what worked for you during that year? I mean, would you like to share more? Would you, would you not like to share what would be best yeah, for you? Yeah, no, it's fine. No, 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 definitely. Um, I think what I did in 2018 was I was so, I was trying to deny the fact that dad had passed away. And so I was just focusing on working really hard and not giving my space, my, myself the space to breathe and grieve. And grief comes in all sorts of different shapes and sizes and forms and suddenly hits you and then you bubble on a little bit. And it, I'd never really been through anything like that before. And I don't think, you know, losing a parent is is devastating. Um, so I think I was just trying to... I was just in denial, really. And I got through to May, which was six months after he passed away. And I was due to go on a training course. Um, and I was sat with a colleague who had been through the same thing as me. And we were just talking it through. And he was a bit concerned about me. And he said, look, just just stop. Just take a couple of weeks off. Go home. Sit and cry. Sit and do whatever. Just you need to stop. because." you are not in a good place. Um, And then I wrote a blog called Mission to Self-Destruct, Successfully Aborted. And it was like, it was just the most cathartic thing I think that I've ever written. And I've written quite a few blogs about different things, but this particular one was me saying, okay, I'm not fine. And when you admit it, people are there to support you. You know, the, a lot of people are saying, are you sure you're okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Of course I'm fine. You know, you put up this, this barrier and this wall and this stiff upper lip and you just get on with stuff. And, uh, and then I'm like, actually, no, I'm not okay. And I took a couple of weeks off and gave myself time just to breathe. I think, what I also started doing was relying a little bit too much on the old glass of wine, <laughs> which, you know, I get home from a trip and I, and I have a glass of wine or what have you as a bit of a treat, but this carried on a bit more and I wasn't ever going to get bad because I knew I had to rein it in a bit, but I was using, I wasn't even getting drunk I was just drinking too often and it was starting to affect my fitness as well and it was actually in June um beginning or end of May this year I thought right I need to stop this and the only way to stop it is just to stop so because I'd injured myself at the end of March this year and I had six weeks off work and you know it was like oh I can have a glass of wine every night then because it doesn't matter I'm not training so therefore and then I ended up creating this lovely wine barrel around my waist (laughs) Um, and I'm like right okay this is not I'm not sleeping well I'm feeling unfit I'm putting on weight and I don't want to and this is just silly so I I stopped I stopped drinking at the beginning of June and since then I actually had a gin and tonic in Tanzania last weekend and really didn't enjoy it and uh, I think that's just a sort of, you know, it was a way of me going, yeah, no, I definitely made the right decision. And I will have a drink again and I will have, you know, but I, I think I was very conscious of using something else as a bit of a crux and alcohol is never good for that, you know. So, and and whoever said that you lose loads of weight when you give up drinking is a complete liar because you don't. I've still got this I'm still trying to get rid of this little wine barrel and turn it into a six pack but um but it's you know yeah grief is horrible really horrible but you you can't stop you've just got to carry on and and work with it not against it um so yeah yeah thank no thank you thank you for sharing that because um I think it's so useful I've 
I do remember reading reading that blog post and yeah. it was it was so raw but I, but I imagine you know the outpouring that you got was was love and support and and encouragement and 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 help um which is just incredibly powerful yeah it is it's, it's funny because I I was talking to a friend um last month and we were talking about it and, and I still Oh, I don't want to cry. Um, <laughs> I still miss dad enormously. Um, and I think, you know, you, you're always going to, and grief changes from this sort of raw beast into something that you, that you settle with. Um, and sometimes I can be, you know, driving up to the airport or driving down to mum's and uh or you know just walking and something comes on the radio or a song or a smell like cut grass reminds me of my childhood massively and and I just burst into tears and and this this friend was like still (laughs) I'm like it's not you know I knew dad for 46 47 years of my life my whole life you know you you can't it's like when I'm talking to mum and about her grief and you know trying to just be there for her when she's been going through the absolute depths of hell they were together for 53 years that is a lifetime and you don't just people you know you don't just move on 18 months later and go right that's it I'm done you know thanks very much I've had my time you know it is it will always be there and I have um back in 2014 I got some fingerprint jewelry done for my mum and dad's fingerprints and it's a necklace and it is my most treasured possession and they it means that they're there all the time and since 2013 they've been hanging around my neck uh but they're there and you know when I'm worried or anything I'll just sort of you know touch their fingerprints and and feel the connection but life goes on life has to go on we all are going to die at some point it's just what we do with the time that we've got, I think, is really important. And dad was the epitome of getting, just squeezing the most out of life, you know. And and I want to do him proud and hopefully am. And mum proud because I'm really proud of her and what, you know, how she's come through it as well. So, so yeah, she'll be listening to this as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say, hi, mum. Hi, mum. Hi, mum. Hi, mum. Hi, mum. Um, yeah, she's. I'm so proud of her because mum and dad were such a unit, and I think you you don't realise how much so until one of that pair is not there, and she's really gone through it, but has has come out a, a stronger person. Um, and you know, I hope she has my dogs a lot, and I hope they help a bit. <laughs> uh, you know, and she's gone out and and done stuff on her own that she would probably never have done before because dad was always there you know they always did things together um and as she's become a much more she's always independent and she's incredibly strong and and you know they they set my brother and myself up for a great life um emotionally and mentally and and yeah i'm I'm super proud of her well done mum yeah (laughs) yeah i'm really proud of her yeah way to go but um, yeah, but it's the same same for mum as it is for me. You know, they they it it still it will still hit you. And when I'm talking, it depends who I'm talking to as to how much I say or what I say. And but I usually have to walk away at some point because it's still really raw. Yeah. Um. You know. But and it will. You know, I've got friends whose parents passed away years ago, and they still you still will hear that in their voice um so yeah but life goes on and dad you know dad would just be for god's sake what are you wasting that emotion on me for and you know all of this and but uh yeah bless him well you've got an exciting 2019 coming up big big final push but I want to mix things up a little bit because we've never actually done the quick fire questions with you because you were one of like the first people that I caught back up with with uh, with tough girl extra which is which is awesome and so I think you were one of the th- one of the first people who we've had on three times so you're just oh brilliant smashing Thank it you. out of the park <laughs> okay 
So my questions are going to be quick, but your answers don't have to be. Okay. Are you a morning or evening person? Morning. What time does your alarm go off in the morning? Oh, so when I'm at home, I just wake up naturally, but usually it's around seven in the morning um, because I've got dogs and they usually want to go out uh, and start their day as well. Um, So yeah, at home, usually sort of seven, seven thirty. When I'm on expedition, I'm guided by whatever time we get up. So on Kilimanjaro last week, I was, you know, we wake up quarter six, six o'clock in the morning. Um, but it's really important for me to be a morning person because usually clients in the morning aren't quite there. <laughs> so I have, I need to be that enthusiasm, not annoyingly, but that sort of person that gets the day going, um, and us out of camp in the morning and, and then we sort of settle into the day. So I think I've always been a morning. I used to work with horses years ago and so you're always up early in the morning with them. So, yeah. What time do you go to bed at night? When I'm at home, usually about 10, 10 30. Um, I might take my laptop up and watch some TV on my laptop in bed, which is probably not the best idea, but it works for me. And, um, and then again on expedition, I usually go to countries where it gets dark quite early in the evening. So, like in Tanzania, half past six at night, it's dark. You have dinner in the mess tent, and then you're in your tent by eight o'clock at night. So I do a bit of reading or I watch something on my iPad and then I'm usually asleep by nine, which is lovely. (laughs) It's really nice to give yourself that permission to go to bed early. And I don't have children. I live on my own. I've got my dogs and everything. So I think at home I can please myself on expedition. I know I need to get the rest. And I'm I'm off to Nepal tomorrow. So we're calling this. um, I'm off to Nepal on Friday. and. I know still there, you know, it's a much more sociable expedition. So I may be up a bit later, but we're still, you know, we still have breakfast at seven in the morning and leave sort of by eight. So it's nice to be able to get that rest and not feel guilty about it. If I'm in bed, in bed for 10 hours, I'm happy. You know, I've got a great sleeping bag, so I'm more than happy to spend as much time in it as I can. (laughs) So, (laughs) Are you a tea or coffee person? Uh, Coffee. Well, I like both, actually, but I do appreciate a really good cup of coffee. What is your favourite type of food at home and favourite food on expedition? So favourite food at home. Gosh, I love because I don't tend to get fresh food on expedition. I love fresh vegetables and fruit. And I'm a bit of a fan of scrambled eggs on toast with avocado. So that's a, that's a must for me every morning. Um, I'm at home. On expedition, tend to eat because I tend to go to altitude a lot and it's a very carb rich diet. So there's a lot of rice, pasta, potatoes, um, which I tend not to eat a massive amount at home, but I know on expedition they're the right food for me. I know that they're doing my body some good. I know they're going to give me energy. So I just sort of suck it up and get on and eat it. Um, So in Nepal, a good old dalbat. which is a traditionally local dish. Um, yeah, good curries, you know. I just eat what I fancy, really. And that's the nice thing about doing so much exercise is that, you know, I used to, in my early years, worry about what I ate. Um, I put on weight very easily. And uh, and I'm now I feel a little bit heavier than I I'm comfortable with but I know I've got big expedition coming up at the end of the year so I'm just going with it I'm fit and healthy fit and, and healthy and you, you need know, that <laughs> but I, I need that exactly so this morning um I did a little photo shoot with Alex Mason who's going off to row an ocean or two and Wendy Searle who's going off to attempt the the coast to South Pole um speed record and we were all saying how we now need to to bulk up for our expeditions because, you know, Alex is going to be umpteen days at sea and you can't you can't take in that many calories, you know, as many calories as she'll be using. And the same with Wendy, you know, she, we said, what are you eating? And she said, anything and everything. <laughs> she said, I've already put on a stone and she's super fit and super ready for this. Um, but she needs to go out with some insulation so that because she knows she will lose it and you don't want to be 
you know, for, for Everest, I, I went out at a good weight and I owned, I was out there for nine weeks because I led a Everest base camp expedition before I went to climb in 2016. So I was out for nine weeks and I only lost half a stone, which is really good. So I went out fit and healthy, just the right weight. And so I didn't lose a huge amount. But, you know, when you when you know that you're going to be expending that many calories, you do need to you can overdo it a little bit. I've overdone it. But <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, I can have that other chocolate brownie. It's not going to matter. It does. Well, I, said, uh, I put on a stone before my Appalachian Trail and sort of lost that like 50 days in and then lost another stone. So I thought when I was doing the Pacific, um, right, riding the Pacific Coast Highway, I thought all oh, the same thing's going to happen. So I put on a stone before it started yeah. and then nothing shifted. And nothing, I know. <laughs> and it's, you're like, come on, buddy. What I know. Happening? So, yeah, but I know. And I know as well, when I get back from Nepal, I'll probably be, you know, I'll, you, I mean, I've just done Kilimanjaro. I didn't lose any weight. I think because my body is so used to being in that environment now, it's very efficient. So I need to remember at home that I don't need to, <laughs> need to bulk up too much. But I know when I get back from the pool in middle of November, I've got a month before I go to the Antarctic and I need to be training hard in that month to get myself like really I'm I'm fit and I'm ready for it now but I want to be more ready for it you know so I'll be dragging Dave around the new forest and going trying to find any hill I can locally and I'll be in the gym doing sort of core and strength and cardio and I'll be out running and everything so not overdoing it but doing you know doing the right amount and and I'll need to feed my body accordingly and I don't use powders or shakes or anything like that I I rely on on proper food because that is what I get on expedition I don't you know I can't take all this extra fancy stuff I get I get fed you know decent food or I get fed dehydrated meals and and that's what I need my body to be used to so um yeah it's nice it's a nice position to be in but um yeah what book are you currently reading at the moment so I'm a an avid audible listener I'm a really rubbish reader <laughs> so um, and I do a lot of traveling so I've I've gone through so many amazing books on Audible but I've just finished The Yes Man Danny Wallace which is very entertaining I am currently halfway through David Attenborough's life story which is fascinating but he has a very soporific voice and I find myself, you know, I, I can't listen to it when I'm driving because it just sends me off. <laughs> so I listen listen to it when I'm dragging day for however many hours. So, yeah, I, I like, um, I really love autobiographies who are read by the author because I've just listened to Mark Beaumont's Around the World in 80 Days. And listening to it on, aud- on audio book, you get the emotion, you get the angst or the triumph or you know all these really good emotions the ups and downs of the journey and I found it really enjoyable on audible and and yeah so although I've got a few books stacked up I'm just I I tend to go to sleep when I start (laughs) reading which is just rubbish so lots of different types of books um from sort of management stuff to to mindset to and and I've just downloaded some Jenny Eclair books because I love the sound of her voice and she tells a really good story. So, yeah, nice, a nice mixture. What about music? Do you ever sort of like listen to any cheese? Do you have like a favourite type of music, a genre, a favourite mm. song? Quite, I've got quite an eclectic mix. So I tend to listen to music specifically on summit nights. Um, I have my, I have one ear in of my headphones and I put my iPod on shuffle and whatever comes out. So I remember the most specific thing was when I was leaving the South Coal at 8.30 at night on the 18th of May, 2016. And, you know, we'd had a chat before we went and it's like, we'll go at our own pace and it's all going to be good. And I remember leaving, just taking the first steps away from my tent and the Black Eyed Peas came on with tonight's going to be a good night. Oh. <laughs> I, was, I was like, if any, and it turned out to be quite a tough summit night, but it all worked out well. And, and 
you know, it's those little things. And I was, I said to my group last week on Killy, you know, stick one ear in because when Michael Bublé comes on, you will absolutely want to hear his his dulcet tone singing to you down your ear. So, yeah, I have, I've got quite a an eclectic mix. Um, love that, but it, yeah, I love it. Yeah, I love it. Now you mentioned that sometimes when you go to go to bed, you're a little bit naughty. You take your laptop with you, which yeah. I do the same thing. Yeah. Um, do you have Do you have Netflix or do you do you watch like I don't know BBC iPlayer? Do you watch Are there any yeah. TV shows that you're particularly liking at the moment or movies that you love? Well, I tend to I tend to catch up quite a lot when I'm home. So I'm I've been home. I got back from Killy on Sunday and I'm off to Paul on Friday tomorrow so I've only been home for a few days so I've caught up with Strictly Come Dancing because I love that just absolutely die to be in that audience um Bake Off um I also love documentaries on Netflix there's some really good ones I've watched about people who've gone through amazing times and dealing with adversity and how they sort of pushed on through all of that um yeah documentaries about the planet I love that quite scary at times but yeah so and I've just I put up a post yesterday about any recommendations for any box sets and Downton Abbey came up a few times so I've never watched it so maybe I need to now yeah so so a nice mixture of sort of reality not reality tv because I can't stand that but sort of seeing things from a different perspective and and documentaries and stuff Simon Reeves quite a fan of Simon Reeves so yeah watch him quite a lot too Two more questions. Yes. Okay. Do you have a favorite piece of kit or gear? What do you never leave home without? Or what's like your, apart from Dave, obviously, who retire. <laughs> <laughs> He's obviously up there. Yeah. God, I've got, I've kind of got a little collection of favorite kit. Probably the main one is my SIG thermal coffee mug. I take that all around the world with me. My water to go bottle because it's got a filter in. So I, I haven't bought a plastic bottle or used a plastic bottle around the world for for a good few years now. And my Leatherman, which I lost in Killy um, and Tanzania. Oh, no, where was I? Kilimanjaro Airport last Sunday. I had it in my hand luggage. And that particular one was a replacement for the one that I lost in the earthquake in Nepal in 2015. And... I had it in my hand luggage and they obviously wouldn't let me take it through. <laughs> so in the in the naughty sharps bin it went and fortunately Leatherman have been amazing and have replaced it for me. So Aww. safety equipment is really important and it's a really basic piece of equipment, but it can it can make the biggest difference. So yeah, I think hydration in coffee and water and then my Leatherman. Love That's it. it. It's bright red as well. It's fantastic. So I'm definitely not losing this one now. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a mantra or words that you live your life by or try to live your life by that you try to embrace? I think that say yes now and figure it out later is very much is very much in the forefront to me, but it's not say yes to everything. And I think I have been over the last few years, I've been a bit um, too keen to say yes to stuff and then have realized that either I just don't have the time or the, yeah, maybe saying yes to too much stuff because when opportunity, opportunities come along, you just want to grab them. But yeah, say saying yes now and find your Everest. You know, I use that on my hashtags because it doesn't matter what it is. It can be doing the couch to 5k. It can be getting a PB at park run, or it can be going off and doing a big expedition. Your Everest is personal to you and uh, whatever it is, go find it. Absolutely. And Joe, how can people follow along with you, follow along with your various expeditions and keep updated with your travels and adventures? I'm across all social media. So just, I never thought I'd say this, but Google Joe Bradshaw. <laughs> yeah, Google yeah, Joe Bradshaw. Must, know, you must get the same as well. It's like, just Google my name. <laughs> um, my website is joebradshaw.co.uk and all my links to Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn are on there. I do the majority of my updates on Facebook and Instagram because that seems to work the best for me. Twitter doesn't really float my boat. So, um, yeah, so there. And I'm off to Vincent on the 14th of December. So that's number six of the seven summits. 
So I've got a lot of fundraising to do for that and the charity in place to be before then. And then hopefully, fingers crossed, if all goes according to plan, number seven will be Carsten's Pyramid, which is now in March next year. March 2020. Amazing. March 2020. Hopefully I'll be that out there for my 49th birthday, which would be quite cool. Oh, my God. That would be very so, cool. Yes. Oh, um, no. Well, Joe, a massive thank you for coming back on the Tough Girl Podcast Extra. Oh, my it's, pleasure. It's been, honestly, it's just so inspiring to talk with you. And thank you so much for, for sharing what, what you've shared. I really do appreciate it. And I know so many people will, will benefit for, from hearing you speak and all the advice oh, my and, pleasure. And, and tips. So best of luck with all the future challenges. And we'll, we'll, we're going to continue catching up with Jo once she can, when she completes Oh, fingers summits. crossed, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Sarah. It's been absolutely amazing to, to talk to you again. So thank you. Hey Tribe, I hope you enjoyed that episode with Joe. What an absolute legend. Joe also talked about um, Alex Mason and Wendy Searle, who are both doing future challenges in 2020. So you can go back and listen to their episodes as well. Both highly fascinating. I'd also recommend that you go and check out toughgirlchallenges.com, which is the main website. That is the central hub where you can find out everything you need to know about Tough Girl Challenges, about my mission to increase the amount of female role models in the media. You can find out more information about me, my background, the different challenges that I've done. Um, You can find information about the various books that I've written on climbing Kilimanjaro, running the Marathon de Saabs, and there's also a book on chalet hosting. There is more information on the blog as well. So everything that we've talked about today, I write it up into show notes which goes on to the blog and so if you if you found something that's tickled your fancy and you want to find out what it is you can always go back and click on the show notes to get that information so that is toughgirlchallenges.com there's now over 230 240 episodes of the tough girl podcast i've also been putting out extra tough girl extra podcast episodes throughout the months of um of November and there's going to be more episodes coming out in the month of December as well so just to give you a little heads up of some of the people that we're going to be catching up with I'm really delighted that we've got uh, Paula Reed coming back on the Tough Girl podcast we're going to be catching up with Sarah Uton, Melissa Yuri, um, we're Anna Blackwell, Lindsay Cole, Kat Davis, uh, Catherine Bertine, Phoebe Smith, Emily pen there is um yeah so it's just basically there's a lot of amazing content coming out especially in like november and december big push at the moment because we're coming up to one million downloads one million listens of the tough girl podcast which is phenomenal to think where we started and how far we've come so obviously you know be incredible to hit that number just as recognition of how many stories how many of these women's stories are being heard and what I'm really hoping that it does is that it inspires you to think about what it is that you want to do in your life what adventure what challenge do you want to go on what do you want to achieve and like Joe says you've got one life and you really do have to get after it this there is no plan b this is it You've got to decide what it is that you want to do, and then you've got to get after it. You've got to take the first step, which I know is hard, but I believe in you. So what I want you to do today is to take that first step. Whatever it is that you want to do, get after it, go for it, make it happen. Believe in yourself because I believe in you. Massive thank you again to all of my patrons who are supporting via Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast. I would not be able to produce this amount of content without your financial support every single month. It is a game changer having you supporting me at $2 a month, $5 a month, $10 a month, $15 a month, $25 a month. I cannot tell you uh, what a relief is knowing that I have a regular source of income coming in and that I'm not going to debt anymore producing this content. So if you want to increase the amount of female role models in the media, if you want to pay it forward, if you want to give back, please sign up. Wouldn't it be an amazing Christmas present to give me as well? Have a little think about that one. All right, take care, lots of love, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye. Bye.